This is a video I've been wanting to make for a while. A full capstan motor uh, overhaul rebuild on a uh, either the 122 Mark II or III, very similar on both of them. And this is a particularly good board to do it on because I've run into some uh, previous work that's been done on this and uh, some problems. And what that is, the motor coil leads here. Uh, it was probably an attempt to replace this with uh, one of the new boards, one of the new replacement boards. And you can see right there that lead has been broken off and extended out, resoldered. And the problem I have with it is that it's exposed. It doesn't have any insulation on it. And the other thing is I, the soldering on this board doesn't give me a lot of confidence that that joint will hold. And so I want to redo the joint and add some insulation to it and then uh, recap this board. And the other thing I'd like to do on the recapping is to show um, three different ways to remove these old SMB caps. And one of the things that we run into on these is that there's a good possibility the caps have leaked and the electrolyte has possibly compromised the uh, trace. At very minimal, it's oxidized the old uh, lead-free solder and so it makes it more difficult to remove. So I'm going to show uh, three different ways to do that. Um, and I hope that that might help somebody out. I typically prefer the uh, snipping them off method. It's safe. It's quick. It's effective. Uh, there are right ways and wrong ways of doing that. I don't like the twist off method. I think that's a disaster waiting to happen. But on the snipping method, the thing that's really important is to snip parallel to the leads, like this, not at right angles to them. Not like that. And the other important thing is to put a lot of downward pressure uh, while I'm snipping, really about as much as I'm comfortable with. That will prevent lifting the pad. And I don't want to lift those pads. I've had to repair them before. And it's a difficult and time-consuming process. So if I can avoid that, I'm going to avoid it. There's the repair. Okay, let's do a couple more of these. I get the snips right in that uh, indentation at the bottom of the capacitor. A lot of pressure, and they just they just pop right off. Again, I advise against the twisting method. Um, I've seen people do it. I've seen people uh, promote it. I don't like it. Now, let's get a little bit closer on this. Again, parallel. Just, just push down on it about, you know, about as hard as I am comfortable without breaking something. And it just very simply pops off. The other big benefit of this is not so many heating cycles on those pads. These are delicate now at this point, especially if they've had leakage. Those damaged ones were badly leaked. Let's see what can happen if uh, you place the snippers 
at right angles to the leads, it's possible that I can get underneath them and shear those off. Doing it the other way, um, there's much less risk. And so that's my, that's my tip for the day. I'll show you how fast those old those old leads will pop off with very little heating and of course some good flux and they just pop right off and that's it I tried to show this in other videos, but every single time I did this, uh, this process, something happened, the camera stopped, I forgot to turn it on, the focus was bad, all different things happened. And so I'm trying really hard on this one to capture the whole procedure, or my procedure anyway. Okay, the next method that a lot of people like is uh, low melt solder, low temp solder. Um, this happens to be the Chip Quick brand. It comes with its own flux. I'm just going to use the flux I've already got opened up here. This is a good method. It It's um, maybe not the best on these pads that are oxidized and maybe corroded a little bit because it does require more heating time but it works it works beautifully it's not a problem to use it so that's just what i'm using because it's already sitting on my bench and i'm sure everybody knows how to do this just uh, melt the solder on there it stays uh, f it stays liquid for a much longer period of time than the uh, standard solder and so you can just work back and forth and it'll eventually get underneath the pad and it'll just allow you to uh, remove it easily of course it's meant mostly for ICs but it works on these two but again the difference being the heating cycle time on that is quite long. This is a good board. The traces are not damaged badly. Um, some of them are, are very corroded and they've, they've gone a long time in that condition and everything is risky on those and the chances are that I'll probably be repairing something or uh, doing something to make up for the the damaged pad it's just part of the part of the procedure you have to be prepared to deal with and repair traces and pads okay so like i say it works great but it does require does require a little bit more dwell time The, that uh, low temp solder has to get underneath that SMD and so it's not the same as doing it on a chip or on a surface mount um, component. It's a, it takes a little bit longer on this. So it's not my favorite, not my favorite method. Now the third method, and this also works pretty well, is uh, to use two soldering irons. I don't at this point own the uh, solder tweezers and so but this works fine. 
Um, it's always good to begin with adding some fresh solder to the joints. Of course, this adds a heating cycle again, which may or may not be desirable. Generally, it's not. Get this. Uh, the siren plugged in and heated up. A few moments later. have a clean tip and there's there's how that works And that's fine too. Again, it's just this uh, heating cycle problem that I, I don't care for. Or not problem, but just having the multiple heating cycles try to reduce those as few as possible. And this is not the low melt solder on this. I just use standard solder on those small capacitors like that. but good flux, a good RA flux to cut through the old corrosion. Yeah. Clean those up and remove those very tiny hair-like leads I like to clean these pads with solder wick, um, not just to get rid of the old solder, but to abrade it, abrade the pad a little bit. There are times, and I've done it in videos, and I've shown it in videos, sometimes the pad just won't clean up. It's got so much corrosion on it, it's almost impossible to get new and fresh solder to stick, and it takes multiple cleanings. So the solder wick is is a good help for that just very very gently These really can't be cleaned up too well. I try to get everything off of them as I possibly can. Here 
remove these motor coils. And typically, I'm able to bend the uh, hall sensors back, but these are these are adhered very well, and so I'm just going to leave those on there. A lot of times that adhesive is dried off, and it needs to be replaced anyway. But in this case, that stuck, and so we'll just take them. We'll just take them off this way. Now you can get a little bit better sense of what I saw up close. Um, the one lead is, the, the, all the leads are actually have been kinked. Um, probably pulled too tight. You know, this is soft copper and it can, it can take a lot of gradual bending. It can take a lot of large radii, um, but it can't take being kinked. You know, just like think of a, a a tube. You get to a certain point and it it kinks, and yeah, you can bend it back and wink at it, but it's still going to cause problems. And that's what's happened here. Copper will work harden, and when it's when it's bent solid like that, it will you'll have problems with it. And the fact that it was done like that is the other clue that I know I need to deal with this, that it won't last. It could, it could break at any time. It could break during shipping, just anything. Yeah, trying to be very gentle there and course it ends up ends up breaking and so that's fine I, I was going to resolder it anyway Pucker factor on this is is quite intense. I'm just trying to get access to it so that I can resolder it. Maybe even attach. Not, not just resolder, but attach a new lead to it is my goal. And then be able to insulate it. And there it goes. And it left me a little tiny stub right, right there to solder onto, and I can do that. But that's obviously right where it got pulled too hard and got kinked. And um, that's the result. So I end up. I did get that soldered. There's what it's left me with. And I did get the uh, insulation scraped off of it. I put my tiniest screwdriver there and scraped the insulation off. 
and I got a new lead soldered onto it. And while I was getting ready to uh, uh, insulate that with some conformal coating, just the tiniest movement broke it off flush with the coil. So I had to get that coil off and uh, my procedure for that was to put a big copper heat sink on the other coils and then use a heat gun to remove it to break down the uh, adhesive and remove that coil and then unwind and reattach one uh, one winding. And this is making me now think that I should uh, make a fixture for winding those coils because I don't think this is going to be a unique to this particular deck. I've seen them before. They've come in with, you know, similar problems, but the, the leads were never this brittle. I never ran into that sort of problem. I'm just using 3M 1357 here as the uh, uh, coating to keep those <laughs> leads from moving around too much. But it's still it's something that needs to remain pliable, and this this won't harden up and become brittle. So now I've got the board all cleaned up, nice and shiny. And that's, that's what I want it to look like. None of the old solder remaining. Um, everything cleaned off. And have a fresh start. I also clean uh, the actual solder itself. And there's a reason why. By having no contamination and having everything so clean, the other benefit here is, again, uh, staying off those pads. It only takes a tiny amount of dwell time to get the solder to flow. If these are contaminated with anything, I'll be on them a lot longer. So I clean the tip between each joint and I try to get on them as fast as possible and off as fast as possible. I've got my replacement capacitors already trimmed and cleaned and tinned and this is a difficult job trying to do it with the camera I kinda wish I'd have set up a, a secondary camera to get a little bit better shot and get my fingers out of it but um, I'll, I'll do that next time So this is a process of trying to, not trying, it, it's necessary to get the lead in contact with the pad, not just floating in a blob of solder. And 
way I do that. Maybe I can show it better on this one. How am I going to do that and not have my fingers in the way? And some tweezers, maybe. So the way I do that is to just tack the one leg, just get it in place so that the other leg can be positioned. And I want to try to have that other lead in the center of the pad as much as possible. Okay, and then what I'll do is this one gets soldered. I'll put downward pressure on it while I hit it with the iron and then hold it down onto the pad while it's uh, setting setting up. Those are small pads so I'm going to add a little bit more. And now I'll just hit it one more time and make sure it's seated down on the pad. Put downward pressure on it. Do both of them. And I'm sorry you can't see that but I'll try better on a, a different one. You can see that okay. And that's it. And that gets it in contact. And that's a much more reliable joint than if there's, uh, you know, if it's floating inside that solder. I've replaced these on my own decks in the past with, in fact, I've got one that's probably going on 10 or 11 years on the repair with, uh, I've replaced it with the good SMD caps. It does fine. There's not a problem with them. They're easier to deal with than these are, of course, and the job is faster. I don't have any evidence of this or any data to back it up, but I feel like I get better performance out of these conventional electrolytics than I do out of the SMDs. I've never done A-B tests with it, but I get really good consistency with these. You know, front to back of tape, uh, wound flutter numbers, uh, speed consistency. So this is what I do. I, I prefer this, even though it's harder and more expensive and takes more time. That one was pretty visible. Maybe if I zoom in a little bit. Okay, there, tack it down. Push that one down. I want to completely cover those leads, and so I'm going to add a little bit more. Again, I'm, it, I'm not dwelling on that pad very long because everything is so clean, I don't have to. Okay, here you go. There. And you can kind of see it drop down and make contact. Okay, so that was, I think, pretty visible.
See, so that first that first joint is just a tack. That's not a solder joint. I go back and and resolder it afterwards. This is a tricky one. I should have done this one before I did the other one. those up and now very carefully position that in the center hole and reduce the risk of pending any of those so brittle leads again I've also tinned the hall sensor leads and clean those screws in loose and then just uh, let everything seat where it wants to be and then tighten them up This one here is just a little bit short and I'm not going to pull that. The, the very tip of it can actually get into the solder but I'm not going to pull on that at all. I'll just double that up. I wasn't too concerned about the four on this side as much. They didn't seem to suffer that much damage. They weren't the other leads were uh, kinked in multiple places. These weren't too bad. And so I, I, I can almost treat these normally, but I'm still exercising a lot of caution. I don't have a replacement uh, coil board for this. And if it doesn't work, then I'm faced with trying to find one or trying to find a uh, parts deck and there really are no parts decks anymore. There's not much that isn't repairable and Because these are so you know rare and valuable uh, It's gonna hurt to dedicate one and destroy one just to get a couple of motor coils So there's my long one that I pulled out. Looks like I need to do a little bit of stripping of insulation on this one. I didn't go quite far enough.
already got. I, I keep these tinned and prepared for sitting on the bench so I can just grab them when I need them. It's a lead wire. Everything positioned in place and give it one one shot I think it would be smart to get a little bit of uh, flux on there too even though everything is clean and I'm just going to take every bit of help I can get Maybe should have fast forwarded through this, but I kind of wanted to show uh, how deliberate of a process it really is. This isn't something I would I would do just willy nilly. All right, I'm going to hit the solder quickly and get over there as fast as I can. Touch it. I give it just a little tug. Okay, I'm happy with that. Give it an inspection. Of course, this would be the worst one, so I want to make sure that this is hundred percent before I move on in case I have to take it off again I have to turn on one of my uh, evil incandescents here all right let's get that terrible thing turned off before it starts to vaporize the ice caps on Pluto. And before I continue, I want to make absolutely certain that I'm that I'm okay on these two problem children. Very good. 15.1, I expect around 14.6, so I'm okay with that. Okay, very good. Very good. We'll continue with the uh, soldering. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Of course, we'll double check them after they're all in place. I'm going to take a quick pause here and have you look at this damage on that screw where an attempt was made to turn it and it was probably frozen or maybe you know not insufficient contact but the screwdriver cammed out and scratched the brass 
and also very likely made contact with those coil leads. And that may have been what damaged them and is causing the problems that I'm experiencing now. So I don't criticize anybody for that. I know that a lot of us will open something up and start turning screws, uh, trying to fix something. And, you know, I've done it. I learn more from breaking things than I ever learned from reading about how to repair them. But that's very likely what happened on here now that I look at it up close and and after the experience of seeing the brittleness on the coils and how or the leads and how they were kinked so badly. So no criticism, just uh, observation. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just push down. I, I'm trying to accomplish the same thing as to, you know, get the lead down, but it doesn't matter on this like it does on the uh, capacitors where there's some weight there. I have no problem with this thin wire floating in that solder. There's no, no chance that it will ever crack. mainly just holding it in place while I'm flowing it. Yeah, thank God my hands are still steady enough to be able to do this kind of work. And even though everything is as clean as it is, I wasn't liking the um, way that that solder was setting up. I, I, it wasn't bright the way I wanted it to be. So I'll just go back and hit it with a little bit of the flux and then clean the flux off. hope this isn't too boring, uh, but this is the procedure. And this is what I go through on this. I don't like to compromise on these things. And I don't care how long they take. You know, if I don't have quality and consistency, then speed only means I'm turning out garbage more quickly. So I like the way those look. That's what I'm after in a solder joint. I've just got to scrape a little bit of that insulation off that one lead and then run our tests and see how we did. It's about, it's about halfway into that joint and there's no way I'm going to pull this another half a millimeter. <laughs> I'll just scrape it off and expose some more bare copper.
and then with a little bit of heat and a little bit of flux they will do the job I'm just tinning. I know it looks like I'm down on it, but uh, I'm really not. It's still off the surface, and I'm just tinning it. I want to actually see that it solder will flow on it before I try to embed it. Let's test them. Fifteen point six horseshoes. Very nice. Okay. We may proceed. Clean that uh, flux off. While I'm working on this part. I'm going to mention that I was contacted by uh, Jefferson Oliveira, who's the uh, distributor of these replacement boards and gear sets for the 122 Mark IIs and the boards for the Mark or the Mark threes and the boards for the Mark IIs. And he contacted me about sending me some of his products and uh, uh, having me use them in a video, a repair video. And I like that idea. I like the idea of doing a, uh, you know, more like a tutorial type video uh, using his products. I think it would be a beneficial thing. The only thing I lacked was a deck or a transport that needed that and so I suggested to him that uh, we would find maybe even one of his that he could send me and I would do the uh, video and then link to his products and so forth uh, I think they're good products I, I have them here in stock I've purchased them but I've just not had the opportunity to use them because if possible I try to I try to repair the factory boards and I've been successful at it um, it's just a known quantity you know these things have been operational for 20 or 30 years and with some maintenance and parts replacements they'll be operational for another 20 or 30 years so if you're interested in seeing that um, let me know put it down in the comments let me know what you think about that 
this is pretty close to a full tutorial on that, but it's, it's also got a lot of additional. And the other would be a short video replacing the coils and, uh, you know, disassembling the deck, the transport, replacing the coil, servicing the motor and, and putting it back together. It would probably be half as long as this one or even less. Anyway, let me know. Let me know your thoughts if that's something you're interested in seeing. I'll relay that to him. Okay, we'll finally get around to servicing this thrust bearing. I didn't worry one bit about it falling out while I was working on it because it is it's firmly glued in place and really the only way to get this out is just to dissolve that grease with some isopropyl and this definitely needs to be done this old this old grease needs to be replaced with uh, new modern grease. This this is the uh, thrust bearing the back of the capstan rides on this all the time. And so it needs to be a good product. And I'll be using uh, Krytox on it. This will be a lifetime lifetime lubricant. Look how bad that was. That was just unbelievably hardened grease. It was doing nothing. It also looked a little burnt, but it may have just been dark. Just a little spring steel thrust washer. Or I guess thrust bearing would be a better, better description. Yeah, it's probably a little bit too much there. Yeah, that's that's more like it. Okay, time to service the rest of the assembly. I'll just wipe this down with some isopropyl. Clean the ends of the capstan bearings. And just run that through there and make sure that no debris falling out or Looks really clean, no problems there. I like to place heat shrink tubing on these uh, brass mounting studs. I just do this for resonance dampening. Uh, <laughs> It's apparent in the video from the camera angle. I can't see it from my position, but uh, it's not. There's no hot air coming out of this hot air gun, and you see in the video that the end is plugged up. But I, I wasn't able to see that from my viewpoint. I keep turning it up and turning the, uh, the temperature up <laughs> and the uh, flow up, and I'm just, it's not making any difference. And I'm thinking, what? What's going on? Did this thing burn out? And of course, eventually I, I see that the end's plugged up. I have no idea where that came from. But that's what it was right there. Yeah. 
That should work a little better now. So now that that whole assembly is warmed up a little bit, this is the proper time to lubricate those capstan bearings. And the proper way to do this is to lubricate the actual bearing itself and let that soak in. And with it a little bit warm like that, uh, the way it is right now, it facilitates that. The front bearing on this is what takes all the thrust. If you think about the pinch roller bearing down on the capstan and the capstan bearing down on the bearing, that's the one that needs the greatest amount of lubrication. So by doing something like just putting oil on the capstan and then, you know, putting the capstan in from the back and running it around a few times or up and down a few times and thinking that any oil is getting to that front bearing, um, it's not. And I plan on doing a video demonstrating how uh, that procedure just wipes the oil off on the outside of that back bearing that doesn't even need the oil and puddles back there. So what I like to do is put this on uh, in the evening right before I'm done for the day and let it sit overnight and then come back the next day and maybe give it another shot or two and uh, assemble it. Also the type of oil used here is critical. Um, I'm using the PGP 65 because I don't have a spec for that on uh, this particular deck. And when I do have a spec for it, I'll buy the oil for that particular deck when the, the factory recommends one particular thing. This capstan has been bead blasted and there's a moderate amount of wear on that. And when I, when I clean it up and take a look at it, uh, I decide to go ahead and resurface that. I have the ability to bead blast here. Yeah, I'm sorry that didn't focus too well. I, I think I'm actually too close for it to focus on that. But yeah, we'll just take care of that and make that like new. Um, I hear different things about using uh, acids to etch the shaft. Probably not the best idea. Certain acids will cause hydrogen embrittlement in steel. And there is a simple procedure for baking that out, but the, the procedure needs to take place. And I don't know that you could really do it on this with plastic parts and so forth. Anyway, um, I wouldn't do that. I've also heard of people wrapping uh, the pinch roller with abrasive and then just letting it run for a few minutes. You know, that's a procedure that if 50 years ago you had to do that in order to finish a recording session, I think that is fine. But then afterwards, I think you would also take it apart and send it out and get it blasted correctly, get the correct surface finish on it. There are plenty of jewelers and uh, gla you know, glass people and machinists and all sorts of things that have access to bead blasters. And, you know, I don't think if, if, you, if somebody walked in with a shaft all ready to be done into my shop, I'd be happy to do it for them. You know, if it's worth doing, uh, just, you know, it's worth doing right. I didn't need to put quite this much of that polyurethane tape on here. I get a little carried away with that. Really also important to make sure that all that grit is nowhere around. And I obviously 
wasn't about to take my camera anywhere near that bead blaster either. Finally getting to reassembly. And again, this is just another thing I do on these for isolation. This is the contact between the motor, really the only contact between the motor and the transport. And so rather than having metal to metal contact, I'm just isolating that with this little bit of polyurethane tape. And on these particular decks, I also isolate the transport from the chassis. But I don't necessarily show how I do that in Toto. This is strictly for the few times in this deck's life that that uh, capstan will slam up against that bearing. Obviously, when the board's in place, the magnet holds it off of that. But, you know, during transportation, during cleaning, uh, putting on and off or oiling that front bearing, it's just a little, it's just a little extra grease where it prevents it from having metal to metal contact. That's all that's for. It is not necessary. And this deck is lacking the uh, oil seal for the capstan, like most of them are, because they split and fall off. I was able to measure up one that I did find, and so I just duplicate those. And I've tried a number of, well, not a number, I've tried a couple of different materials, uh, standard nylon and Delrin. Uh, acetal. What I finally settled on here was a static dissipating acetal and not for that property but uh, some of the other properties of it should make it last a lot longer than the originals but you can see here it's a little bit difficult to turn with this tool geometry and I haven't quite worked out the tool geometry to keep it from uh, ridging up like that. But when I do, I'll work it out, and then I'll offer these on uh, eBay, maybe Reverb or something, you know, for a few dollars, maybe $7 shipped or something like that is kind of what I'm thinking about. But just based on the physical property that I read on the specs on this material, it should outlast the factory ones by a fair fair amount. But you can see I've got to do a little work on tool geometry and get that all worked out before I can mass produce them. Or limited mass, limited mass production I guess. And I think everybody knows or should know that uh, these should be held off of the bearing by, you know, 
a millimeter, something like that, a few thousandths, to And see, there's some of those times when that capstan gets slammed up against that inside bearing. Just like this, when you're moving that. And so that's why I put that little drop of grease in there. That's about how it should be. You know, half a millimeter, 20 thousandths, something like that. So maybe yearly, pull that oil seal forward a little bit. Get half a drop of the proper oil in that front bearing and then push the uh, oil seal back clean the capstan I mean clean the capstan more often than once a year but the oiling I, I do mine about once a year I think that's adequate Because I know that capstan thrust bearing has been manipulated, I wanted to try to find the spec for the end play. Uh, the way I did on the uh, Denon deck in the uh, former videos, that was right in the manual, and I don't remember ever having seen it in the Tascam manual, but I'm going to double check. For some reason in my mind, I, I, in the back of my mind, I know I've seen that spec somewhere. I just can't remember where I saw it or what it is. But I would really like to check it on this deck. And it won't be, it won't be there. Maybe it'll be in the 122 Mark II manual. Gosh, look how much nicer this man is. Look how they did the, how beautiful the photos are. Yeah, I'm not, I don't, well, what's that right there? Nope, that's not it. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to find it. So that is something I'm going to have to do a little research on, or maybe measure another one that I have here so these leads are such thin gauge wire that um, I'll generally just clip them off and get a fresh get a fresh end on them My procedure on these is to, you know, lightly twist them, put a tiny drop of flux on the tip so that it doesn't wick up under the insulation. And then tin them, leaving about a wired diameter untinned towards where the insulation was stripped. That gives it a better chance of not breaking at that at that juncture. Now some people might think that's maybe over the top, um, but you know how much harder is it to do it that way than to just do it sloppily? and get solder everywhere and get it up underneath the insulation and you know it just it doesn't take that much more time it takes more effort like i've told my kids you know don't fear the effort the thing to fear is the fear of effort that's what gets you in more trouble than anything else
Yeah, this just makes a nice clean job of it this way. Now this is part of the series of videos on this uh, full rebuild, but I wanted to do the motor separately because I knew it was going to be pretty involved and take some time. And so the other videos are still being produced and I'm still filming, working on the deck. So those are coming up. Just replacing that resistor that was there. I haven't evaluated why it's there. I'm just replacing it. And there's the completed job. Just uh, loosely placed back in the chassis for a quick ops check. I'll just let you listen to it here. And it was a good decision to rebuild the rewind motor in this. It is operating just strong as can be. Let's see what the cue's like. Yeah, look at that. I mean, it's just... <laughs> it's working well. That was a good choice on this one. So it passes the test. And I'll continue with the rebuild. Thank you for watching and uh, please like and comment if you do.